So good morning, everybody. I'm Photo Joseph. That's, as it says up here, that's Photo Joseph absolutely everywhere. So if you want to find me on YouTube, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, everywhere, everywhere, it's Photo Joseph. I am a photographer, filmmaker, content creator, YouTuber. Basically, I make stuff. And then I also teach other people how to make stuff. When it comes to video, photography, even live streaming, um, that's all a big part of what I do. I actually host a YouTube show, youtube.com slash photo Joseph, three times a week live. I do a live show about photography and video and sometimes live streaming. We talk about uh, tech, we talk about you know, the, the gear itself, we talk technique. Um, we kind of go all over the place. Sometimes we're really, really basic, low level, kind of what is an aperture type of discussion. Sometimes it's super high level, how to set the master pedestal on your GH5 and why you don't want to mess it up, and these kind of like, discussions. So it's all over the place. So if you're interested in photography or video, which I kind of assume you are, or you wouldn't be here, then uh, please do check that out. Lots of good stuff on there. I'm also sponsored by Panasonic. I'm a Lumix ambassador. And so while today's show is not about Lumix cameras, it's about shooting video, I am going to be talking about it in reference to Lumix cameras because that's what I know and use and love. But of course, pretty much everything you have out there, including this guy right here, shoots video. And what today's topic is all about is the terrifying red button. <laughs> I feel like I need like Halloween music now. <laughs> Who here has never pushed the red button on their camera? Awesome. Just a couple of you. Okay. Who here have pushed it a couple times? You're like, I pushed it once, so I can't raise my hand for never, but I really don't ever shoot video. A couple of you more. Okay, cool. So the whole idea behind this production, uh, this uh, presentation is to get you not to be so afraid of the red button. We'll talk about the basics of shooting video, some of the things you need to know, some of the things that you, know, you learn more of down the road as you get more into it, and just basically get you to the point where you're going to walk out of here going, I cannot wait to push that stupid red button and see what happens next. And the easiest transition into this is to think about how video is the same as still photography. It just happens at 30 frames per second. Or how many of you ever shot with the motor drive mode on your camera, right? And it shoots like, if it's an older, slower camera, maybe three or five frames per second, you got something new and modern, it's like eight, nine, 10, 12 frames per second. Well, this is just 30. That's the same thing. And once you kind of take your mind shift from still photo to video is just 30 frames per second, that's a lot easier. It makes it easier to make that transition. I'm still pushing one button on my camera. I still have to do the same things like compose the shot, make sure that the things are in a good place, that the lighting is good. I, all those things still apply to video. Yes, there's more that applies to video, but all the same lessons you've learned for photography about lighting and composition all still apply to video. In fact, some of the best DPs, as director of photography, some of the best DPs that I know started as still photographers. They honed the craft where it was simpler, because photography is simpler it is a little bit easier to do. They hone their, their ability to see light, to understand composition, to set up a, a scene with still photography and then made the transition to video. And when you watch their video versus someone who's only ever done video, there's usually a, a big difference in there. It's quite, quite dramatic. So the other, the other thing that I will add to this kind of the, the caveat is plus sound. Admittedly, you don't have sound in still photography. This is clearly a really important part of video. Uh, in fact, there's a, a quote that I, I've been attributing it to Walter Murch for years. I hope I'm right. Um, but Walter Murch is a, a very famous editor. And the quote is that you don't watch a movie. You watch, listen to a movie. It's two parts, right? The sound is just as important as the video. And you might even argue the sound is more important than the video. How many of you have ever watched a, a video on YouTube or Facebook or something where the video's great or you know, good enough, um, but the audio is kind of stuttering, scratchy? You going to watch that? No. He's like, next, move on to the next one. But if the video is kind of bad, but the audio is good, you'll put up with it. Because you want the content. You can hear the content. You can hear what's happening. You learn whatever it is you're trying to learn. The video may be bad, but you'll put up with that. We can't put up with bad audio. So audio is really important. We're going to talk about audio quite a bit. Not quite a bit. We're going to get into some audio um, pieces here. But let's, let's just talk about the still versus video aspect for a moment. Some stuff I shot yesterday just for you guys. This is your home. And it's a still picture, lovely still picture. But why can't that picture move? And there's sound, this is ambient sound, just the sound that's there. The trees are moving, the ponds, the lake is moving, you know, there's audio. But then have you ever taken a picture and put it to music for a, like a slideshow? But you can take that, put video to music. It doesn't have to be really fancy sound with big huge microphones and getting awesome audio. You can take video that has pretty cruddy audio and just use that 
like the first one where you could hear the lake, the wind a little bit, maybe some birds going by, just use that, but then add some music to it and suddenly you're, you're kind of mediocre audio, it's okay, because it's just background stuff anyway. Now we're listening to some music and all mixes together. If you're gonna have people on there talking, that's different, we're gonna come to that. But as far as just shooting video and then adding some music to it, it's a really, really easy thing to do and it just adds a whole new dimension to it. How many of you ever, have you ever built a video slideshow from maybe a family vacation or something? You're taking your photos, right? You add some music to it, and like, hey, everybody watch this, watch my slideshow. Um, it's a lot better than the old carousel day. It's just, around, everybody's sitting around, like, please make it end. Um, you know, add some music to it, it's, it's really cool. But if you then add video to it as well, it's a whole nother level. And I'm not saying that you need to shoot entirely video, forget about stills. Think about if you're doing a trip, let's say you're visiting Boston for the first time, and you're gonna obviously go out and take some pictures. But every once in a while, especially when there's something really kind of interesting, some movement happening, push that red button, get some video, and at the beginning, you know, making movies is a whole other thing, that's for later. But just to start, just take some video clips to go along with your still photos. And then when you're building your slideshow, you go, you know what? I shot video of this that actually is kind of cool because you see people on the bridge and the ducks moving by. And, and I'll use that shot instead of the still picture. Um, so you, you have an uh, ability to use both, to shoot both, and incorporate them into that final production, even if that final production is only going to be seen by your friends and family. So that's a, a big part of it. Now let, let's move on to exposure, actually shooting, setting up your camera. The good news here is that it is exactly the same as shooting stills, a little caveats, but essentially it's the same thing. You have the same modes. You can shoot in program, after priority, shutter priority, or manual. So you can start off in program, just be fully automatic about it. I don't want to think about it. It's the same thing as I'm shooting with my smartphone. I don't need to think about it. I just push the button and I get video. And then eventually maybe move into after priority. Now, how many people shoot after priority for shooting stills? That's what I expected. Probably most of you, a couple in the back kind of waving their hands. Like for me personally, I'm almost always in aperture priority mode. I want to control the depth of field. Um, the shutter speed is usually irrelevant to what I'm shooting. Uh, if I'm shooting street photography, it doesn't really matter as long as it's fast enough to handhold. I'm not really going to worry about it. Um, the ISO, I'm not going to worry about too much. So really, aperture is what I want to control. And you can think the same way in video. Right? I want shallow depth of field. I want a lot of stuff in focus. Adjust the aperture. Let the camera do everything else. If you're shooting a program, just like with still photography, it's going to choose a middle of the road aperture. You're going to get a lot of stuff in focus, um, which is great, but maybe that's not what you want. You want something a little bit more artistic, a little bit prettier, so you go for aperture priority, open the lens all the way up. Exactly the same. Shutter priority probably won't really work in shutter priority in video. You certainly can, but here's the thing about, about shutter speed. So if we're shooting still photography, you can shoot at you know, thousands of a second, you can shoot at a thirtieth of a second, you can shoot at half a second. Well, if you're shooting video at 30 frames per second, technically the longest shutter speed can possibly be is a thirtieth of a second. Right? It can't be any longer than that because it's time to take the next picture already. It's time for that next frame of video. So you do have a difference there. But again, if you're shooting in well, any mode, really, it's, you don't have to worry about it. It's just the camera's just going to do it. Um, but that is an important thing to recognize. If you're shooting in really low light where you go, oh, I'm going to put the camera on a tripod and shoot a two-second long still photo, you're not going to be able to do a two-second long video frame. Right? It just doesn't work that way. So at that point, you need to crank up the ISO, open up the aperture, do the other things that you would do to get that exposure. But 30th of a second or faster is going to work just fine. 60th of a second is standard. We're going to call this a completely normal video frame uh, shutter speed. There's a term called shutter angle that you might hear banter, bantered about. This is a, a higher, kind of more professional term. It goes back to the days of film. It's, uh, we're not going to get into what it all is. But if you hear shutter angle sometime, just you, shutter speed. That's what they're talking about. And a 60th of a second is pretty standard. And the reason that 60th of a second is standard is it is half of the duration that the frame can possibly be. So half of that 30th of a second maximum. So when you're recording video, and you think about it like this, over the course of one second, slice into 30 pieces, each one of those pieces is then cut in half. And so you have half of that duration, a 60th of a second, recording something, the other half of it not recording, half of it recording, not recording, and so on. And you might be thinking, well, hold on, 60th of a second is kind of slow. Like if anything's moving, there's going to be blur in that. And you're absolutely right. If you were to freeze frame, park the frame, and there's anything moving in there, you would see a little bit of blur. But in video, that's actually what you want. That little bit of motion blur helps to brain the, uh, blend those frames together and makes it look smooth. You get that smooth movement. If you shoot at a really high shutter speed when shooting video, which you absolutely can do, if you shoot at a really high shutter speed, you end up with a very staccato looking video. We're going back a bit here, but any of you remember the movie Gladiator? 
really reaching out here, but in the beginning opening battle scene, there's this huge you know, in the mud, mud and bricks and body parts and things flying all over the place. And if you remember that, that scene, it was very staccato looking, almost like stroboscopic flash, like someone had been out there and shot bup, 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 with a flash to capture the scene. You saw the mud and dirt every frame across the sky. You didn't see it move. You saw that, 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 like this. That shot at a really, really high shutter speed. Shutter angle for them, narrow shutter angle, but shutter speed. And the, the effect of it is quite jarring. It's not what you expect to see when you see video. But you can do it if you want to. It's a creative choice, as it was in that film. And it just adds a whole other level of texture and sharpness and like, ooh, I'm there type of a thing to it. But for the most part, you're shooting at this longer shutter speed. So if you set up your camera to video and it says, hey, I'm shooting a 60th of a second, and you're going, whoa, that seems slow, it's not. It's OK. That's generally what you want for video. And then, of course, you can shoot manual if you want to and take total control. Again, you can't go slower than the 30th of a second, but um, you can take control over that. So that's up to you. So that's exposure. At, at the end of the day, you don't have to worry about it. Start off in program mode, be fully automatic about it. When you feel a little bit more comfortable, go to aperture, take advantage of that shallow depth of field that your camera can do, and let the camera deal with the rest. It's pretty straightforward. Um, the other thing you can do when you're shooting video is, especially if you're in these semi-automatic modes, is just like with still photography, you can rock the under and over exposure slider. So you can make your video look a little bit darker, look a little bit brighter. And if you're shooting, when you're shooting video, even if you're on a DSLR and it's popped up the mirror and so you're, you're looking at the, they call it live view, right? You're looking at the back of the camera, you're seeing that. At that point, you're seeing the scene as it's being recorded because you're seeing what's on the sensor. When you're shooting with a mirrorless camera, that's always what you're seeing. You're always seeing what the sensor is seeing. So as you adjust your exposure, you actually see it in the viewfinder or on the LCD on the back of the camera. So this little video clip here, you can see it's bouncing a little bit just because I was as I'm moving the slider, we can make it go darker, we can go for a darker part of the scene, expose for the highlights in there. I can crank it up and expose for the shadows, just like you can with still photography. It's no different there. So you have that control. Ride the exposure slider, you're looking through the viewfinder, you're like, oh, it just feels a little bit bright. Just, just rock it down, just make it a little bit darker. Oh, it's too dark, rock it up, make it a little bit brighter. So pretty straightforward. Again, all the same things that we have in still photography. Okay, let's talk about sound a little bit. Now, as I said, the sound is important. If you're shooting dialogue, and you're going to see, I'm going to play a, a video clip that I shot on here um, with some examples on it. If you're shooting dialogue, it's pretty important to have good, clear sound for that. And there's a lot of different ways we can go about capturing sound. First of all, every camera is going to have a built-in microphone. It sucks, but every camera has a built-in microphone. It's better than nothing, right? You will at least capture something. But if you're trying to talk to somebody, it's pretty bad. The next step up is to add something like this, a little shotgun-like microphone, a little miniature shotgun mic. And they come in all different sizes. That one's actually pretty big. And this fuzzy thing on it is, I apologize for the animal lovers of the room, it's called a dead cat. I didn't name it. Hey, the ones that go on your lavalier are called dead kittens. It's even worse. But this thing here is to block wind. So if there's wind blowing against it, all this really fine hair breaks up the wind. And by the time it gets to the microphone, it's gone and you don't hear it. It's remarkable how good that is. Um, there's another mic in the back that doesn't have one on there. It's the same type of thing, shotgun mic. It just doesn't have the cat on it. Um, this is designed, this type of microphone is designed to pick up the audio right in front of it. So right here is going to be the best sound. If I go off axis a little bit, it's going to be a little, little bit quieter. And as I go around to the side, it's very isolating. You're barely going to hear it at all. And so this allows you to really capture the audio that's happening where the camera is pointing. It's great. But then you can step up to a lavalier type microphone, which is what I'm wearing right now to record this show. I'm wearing a lav mic. I've got a wireless pack on here that's plugged into a camera over there. And now the advantage of this is I can be anywhere. If this was recording it, I could be absolutely anywhere and I'm going to still get perfect audio. Even my back is to it. If I go hunk down somewhere, I'm still going to get really good audio. So I'm going to play a clip that has three examples of me talking. The first one is with the on-camera microphone. Second one is going to be with a shotgun mic. And the third one is with a lab. Just so you can experience the difference in here. When you're just using the built-in microphone, you can hardly hear anything. At this point, uh, I'll be surprised if you can actually hear what I'm even saying. Adding an on-camera directional mic makes a huge difference. This is what you'll find most vloggers using. It allows you to pick up the sound that's right in front of the camera, but as things move off to the side, they become less and less audible. You'll still hear them, but they're definitely not as big of a part of the sound footprint. Finally, you get into lavalier mics. A lavalier mic is, well, in this case, it's right here. This allows me to go anywhere. I mean, really, I don't even have to be facing the camera. I can be walking around. I can get actually really quite far from the camera, and you're still going to have essentially perfect sound. 
Now this particular microphone is a very directional one, so you shouldn't be hearing too much of the outside noise at this point. However, there are other microphones that are called omnidirectional microphones, this one's a cardioid, that tend to pick up more of the, the uh, surrounding noise. So you can hear there very, very clearly, right? Massive difference. Going from the on-camera mic just to this was huge and is good enough for the vast majority of stuff you'll need. Most people would never buy a kit like this. It's, it's expensive, it's irrelevant for most things you're doing. And if you really wanted to do a high quality interview, you could do a wired lav, which will cost you maybe $100 as opposed to close to $1,000 for a really good wireless pack. So totally different space there. But you don't have to have that. That's the nice thing. You get a, you get a good mic like this on there and you're gonna get great sound. And again, there, there's different sizes. I know Rode is here, uh, here today. The, that mic in the back is a Rode mic. Um, this is a different brand up here. And if you look at their offering, you'll see little tiny ones that fit on top of the camera to much bigger, even bigger than this, more kind of impressive mics. But audio is an important component to it. But again, just to reiterate what I said in the beginning, don't let that put you off. Don't let that scare you away. You don't have to go out and buy a fancy microphone before you can start shooting video. Just shoot video with the on-camera mic and then do what you can with it. Yes, sir? Yeah, the biggest difference that I heard between your different microphones was how much ambient sound you picked exactly. up. Uh, how much difference does it make if you're in a quiet room? Like sure. So the difference is still remarkable. So the, the ambient sound that you're picking up, first of all, the, the microphone that's built into the camera is called an omnidirectional mic. It means it picks up sound equally from all sides. Yes, it is going to be on the front of the camera pointing towards your subject, but it still is picking up everything everywhere. So that's all the ambient noise as well. If you can hear it, the mic can hear it. The directional mic like this that focuses it is, is eliminating, not completely, but it is reducing, let's call it, all that side noise. In a situation like this, this room, your voice still ha has an echoiness to it that's bouncing off the walls in here. That little omni mic is not picking up just the dialogue from you, it's picking it up, uh, they're picking the reflection off of that wall and that wall and the ceiling and the floor and the echoes of that. So it sounds very tinny, it sounds very echoey and open. When you put a directional mic on there, it is primarily gonna pick up your talking in a lot less of the echo coming off the walls. And then of course with a lavalier microphone, it's going to pick up Primarily what's right here. Now, um, I'll come to you in just a second. So the, this mic, as I said in the video, this is what's called a cardioid mic. This is a very specialized lavalier microphone that is basically like a shotgun, but wearing here. So it's picking up this pattern here. It's not picking up everything else around. Most, most wireless lav kits you see are an omnidirectional mic, so they do pick up a lot more of the surrounding sound. But because you're so close to the sound source, you adjust the levels, the, the gain on the mic, so that me talking here, I'm so close to it that that's, you know, I'm adjusting for that volume. And so you over there, yeah, you'll be on there, but you'll be a lot quieter. Well, what about a separate digital recorder? Absolutely a great way to go as well. So you can have, instead of miking up to there, you can have separate recorder and then you just bring them together in post in their software. And all software today, like Final Cut Premiere, it'll handle that automatically. You say, this is video, this is audio, just sync them and it just does it. It just goes, oh, there it finds, you don't even have to do clappers or anything like that anymore. The software just finds the pattern in the waveform and matches them up perfectly. So what I did here, even when you just had the on-camera mic, was um, I guess every time I've done, you know, I'm using Nikon's, I've done um, just using that camera on sure. camera, there's always a hiss. Always a hiss, yeah. So what you're hearing is the noise floor. So if you, it's kind of like a JPEG where you've got your, your blackest black can possibly be, your whitest white can possibly be. You have your quietest, quietest sound and your loudest sound. And anything that's not in that range is, is gone. You could adjust that wherever you want. But on a tiny little mic like what's built into the camera, you don't have a lot of range in there and you end up having to lift it way, way up so that you can even hear, like if I was shooting you from this distance with that microphone, I'd have to crank the gain all the way up so I'm really hearing every other sound around me. That's the hiss, that just baseline hiss that's there and I'll still barely be able to hear you. It's the same idea what I was talking about with the lavalier microphone, by having it really close to me, I can lower the gain, lower the noise floor so that I am not hearing so much of the outside stuff. Essentially, I'm, I'm turning the mic down so much that I no longer hear the room, but because the mic is so close to me, I can hear me. So if the best way to get good audio, the best audio you're gonna get off of the little microphone is to get as close to your subject as possible. So if I get right in your face, I can now turn the gain down on the microphone and still hear you, and I'm gonna hear a lot less of the, the sound around me. Down to like six, five. Well, you have to look at the audio meters. That's, that's your key. There's, on your camera, there's gonna be a little audio level meter that's bouncing to tell you where your levels are. And you don't want it to peak, because like that JPEG, if it hits the, hits the edge of it, that audio is gone. You've clipped the frequency, it's like clipping your highlights, you're never getting it back. 
So it has to be low enough that it doesn't peak. But it can't be so low that you can't hear it. Because then by the time you raise it up in software to make it louder, you're raising everything, including that noise floor. So it's a balancing act. It really is. And the only way to know is to watch the levels. Watch the meters. It's just like watching a histogram. You've got to watch those meters. And you want to listen to it. You want to put on headphones if you're trying to be really good about it. You want to put on headphones and listen to it and make sure it you know, just does actually sound good. Um, cool. All right, so there's sound. Now let's move on to movement, because movement is, at the end of the day, why we would shoot video. Right? There's the movement that's in the frame. I have the camera sitting here. There's things moving. But then there's movement of the camera itself. Now, we're definitely getting into higher end shooting here, but it's something to think about, something to consider. If I'm going to play a video showing a couple of samples here, but if you handheld, handled the camera and walk around, probably not great. If you're really good about it, if you're really consistent, you really know, you know, there's kind of tricks with how you walk, like you get a little bit lower on your knees and you kind of try really hard to keep the camera steady. You don't want to be bouncing it too much. Um, move slowly and deliberately, or maybe you don't walk, but you do something like move the camera slowly like this, just to get some movement to it. If you watch TV shows, commercials, movies, anything, the cameras are constantly moving. And if you watch older films, they moved a lot less. Today they move so much because it is so affordable to buy things like gimbals and, and all these other gear that you can add to a camera to make it so that you can handhold it and still be really, really steady. I mean, if you look at, look at old movies, you'll see it's all either lock shots or if they're, as they get bigger budget, there might be sliders. And this is, you've seen these things in like Hollywood behind the scenes, literally train tracks on the ground and a camera on a big thing with wheels that moves along. Uh, the steady cam that was invented, for The Shining, I believe is the right, if I'm getting my history right. Um, if you watch The Shining and then watch any movies before that, The Shining was the first movie where you saw major camera movement. This is somebody wearing a rig holding the camera. That cost so much money back then to do, but today, you, for $500 to $1,000, you can buy a handheld motorized gimbal that you balance the camera on, and now I can go anywhere, and it's perfectly smooth. And because these things are so affordable now, you'll see them used everywhere. Even vloggers are walking around with these beautiful handheld motion shots because the gear is so cheap. So but that, that, again, that's higher end. If you're not going to invest in that, you're not going to shoot that much video, you're just going to hand hold it, fine. Just be aware of the movement. Know that you can't do this, right? That's not going to look good. But if you want to have that movement in there, be conscious of it. Do slow, deliberate movements. You can do things like um, you can put a camera on a tabletop and put, a, like a, put it on a towel on a tabletop and then slowly pull the towel. Right? You can get that slider movement. It's not as good as a real slider, but it'll get you the shot. Right? Just like if you don't have a tripod, you get a stack of books or something, you figure out a way to stabilize the shot. Same thing with movement. You find another way to do it. Um, you know, get your kids roller skates and put it on there and slide it across the table. There's lots of little tricks that you can do to get some camera movement in there. A lot of tripods, if you buy a, a video-specific tripod, it'll have what's called a fluid head. And the idea behind a fluid head is it moves very smoothly. So I can do a pan shot. So I'm panning the camera like this, very smoothly you don't get any bumps in it. I'm going to show you a shot next here that is a panning shot. It's not done with a true fluid head. It's kind of this weird hybrid tripod thing that I'm playing with. And it's not as smooth as a, as a true fluid head, but it's kind of good enough. I, you get the movement. It's not as bad as me just doing this with it. Um, so I'm going to hit play real quick and we're going to see that fluid, fluid head, kind of hybrid fluid head movement. So it's kind of, you'll get the idea what it is. And then you're going to see a handheld shot where I'm trying to be pretty smooth, but I'm not being really good about it. And you'll see what that kind of looks like. So pretty smooth, not too shabby. We've done this before. Once or twice. <laughs> So it's not helping things when I'm walking on grass, so it's really hard to be even. So you get that movement, movement in there that's it's not necessarily the nicest thing. Um, if you get too much of it, you can get a little seasick. This is a really wide shot, so you might have seen the edges feeling a little bit wobbly. It just depends on what you're shooting, of course, but it all takes practice. Uh, you know, if you watch YouTube vloggers on YouTube, they're all walking around, they're walking around holding the camera facing them, and it works. It works. And, but they're used to it, too. They have learned how to hold their camera. You look at their earlier stuff, and it's like, oh my god, I'm seasick. I can't watch this. But then they figure it out. 
just like any other craft that you do, you eventually figure out how these things work, you figure out how to get better at it, or what things you go, you know what, I've just drank too much coffee in my life, there's no way I can handhold this thing and have it look good, um, versus no, I, I got this, I, I've got a movement down, I know how to hold the camera, I know how to move, I know how to walk, I know how to make this look pretty good. So you know, it's all about it, but movement is a huge part of it. There's so many things you can do uh, when you start moving the camera. Okay, next up, editing. This is the part that scares people the most. Wait, I've shot all this video, now what the heck am I gonna do with it? So we talked in the beginning about the really simple part of it. You're gonna build a little slideshow, right? It's some stills, some video clips. I'm not so worried about trying to get, uh, I, yeah, I'm not trying to make a new Hollywood feature film here. I'm just trying to tell the story of my family vacation. So I'm gonna take some cool photos, take a few videos, mash them all together, and we have a little bit of a story. That editing is really straightforward. And if you're on a Mac, you use iMovie. Um, if you're on Win Windows users, anybody? Uh, I know there's some basic video editing software. Do you guys know of any, like, by name? Oh, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, I, That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, buy a Mac, and it's easy. <laughs> Or an iPad, and we're going to talk about that too. Uh, Premiere works on PCs pr from Adobe, Adobe Premiere. This is higher end software, but it is very, very powerful. Uh, so Adobe Premiere is fantastic if you want to spend some time learning how to use it, but this is higher end, it's professional level software. On the Mac, you've got iMovie, which is dead easy to use, super, super easy to use. So if you've got a Mac, um, it is either comes with it for free or you can download it for free. I think it's still free. Maybe, maybe they charge something for it now, but whatever. It's close enough to free. It's a super easy video editor. You watch a couple of tutorials and you get it. It's, think of it like building blocks. You've got these blocks of video that you shot, and you're looking at them on your on your, um, in your software, and you're gonna see little blocks, video, 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 video. You drag those blocks onto the timeline. You, re you rearrange those blocks. Ooh, this should have happened before this. You trim off the bad parts, right? Because there's always something bad. And there's another tip for you of when you're shooting video, what's very tempting, because we're so used to shooting stills, is we push the button when something is happening we wanna capture. When you're shooting video, you wanna push the button a little bit before, and then you wanna keep recording for a little bit after. So what I don't want to do is have, uh, you know, this, this is me shooting, right? I don't want to go, go, right? Because then you start talking and I've just, I've, I've no, nothing to work with in the beginning. I want to start recording, wait a couple seconds and then say, go. And by saying go, I'm saying, you know, you've got someone who's going to do something for you. But if you're, whatever it is, you're going to, you're going to capture, I don't know, the train going by. It's a beautiful train. So you go, okay, the train's coming. I, I want to, I want to have it from like right about here. If you start recording right here where you want it, you have no room to work with it. Shoot early, start shooting earlier, start shooting earlier, and then when you're done, you go, I'm done, but I'm gonna keep shooting for a couple more seconds. That gives you room to play on the ends. We call that heads and tails. It gives you a head and a tail to the shot that you can trim it off, you can use it to dissolve into another shot, you can go, oh, I really need another half second of video here to make it line up with the audio, line up with the music that I'm playing with, but I don't have it because I didn't shoot any heads and tails. Shoot more than you need. It's easy, um, so just keep that in mind. Anyway, so when you're editing, you're taking these blocks and dropping them on the timeline. You're rearranging them. You're cutting off those heads and tails. Maybe you put a little dissolve between them. You want to get fancy with it. Maybe you add some music to it. Well, hopefully you add something to it, some kind of audio layer to it. Um, then you get into things like titles, our family vacation. It could be that simple. Uh, you know, you can be really fun about it, starring my daughter Jenny, and right, you can do those kind of things. It, you know, it's kind of fun and goofy, but you can do it. But you take those video clips, maybe even with stills as well, and you start putting them together in this video editing software, and it just isn't that hard to do. It literally is dragging blocks around on the scene, uh, on the timeline, watching it and going, you know, better if this happened before that. That'd be more interesting. So you swap the clips around. Super, super straightforward to do. It, sound, it can sound complicated and scary, especially if you look at some really big pro-level timelines and there's all these layers of video and audio and you're like, there's no way I can do that. You don't need to do that. Most stuff is just one track of video, one track of audio, and that's all you need to do. Someone mentioned the iPad. So if you've got a Mac, you've got iMovie on there. If you've got an iPad, you actually have iMovie on the iPad as well. Um, there's another company called LumaFusion that makes a kind of higher end uh, pro level video editor on the iPad. I'm going to throw out a term there that may not mean anything to most of you, but 4K 60p is pretty high end video. You can edit 4K 60p video on an iPad Pro. It's incredible to be able to do this much editing, this powerful uh, level of editing on a little tiny tablet that you carry around with you is insane. And this is here today, yeah. They broke that update with uh, the new iOS. LumaFusion? Yeah. Broke? Well, no, LumaFusion works fine. You just can't put 4K 60. Oh, yeah, yeah. H5 yeah, no. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually going to fix it in a few weeks. Um, I'm actually dealing with Apple with it right now about it, and they've asked me for some clips to test with. So, yeah, I don't know why they don't have them, but there you go. Yeah, I know that's a bit of a bummer. Um, 
Anyway, so you have an incredible amount of power in a tablet. So you don't have to, and I'm bringing all this up to say, you don't have to say, oh, well, if I'm gonna shoot video, now I gotta go spend $5,000 on, on an iMac Pro to get this big, huge, beefy, you know those things go up to $13,000 if you max it out? <laughs> It's like 64 gigs of RAM, four terabyte. You know, you have that finish like, oh, I need a new computer. Ooh, the Mac, oh, I had this, had that, $13,000. But for less than $1,000, you can get a maxed out iPad Pro that will allow you to do this editing. It's just remarkable. So you don't have to have super high and latest and greatest. And you don't even have to have the latest and greatest, right? You can go back to older hardware. iMovie's been around for over a decade now. You can shoot, you can edit with iMovie on an older Mac. Maybe you can't do 4K 60p video, but you can certainly um, edit normal high definition video, no problem on an older Mac or PC. So, um, so yeah, check this out. So Premiere, if you're gonna go into the higher end and you're on Windows, it's Premiere. Lower end on Windows, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you to look at, but just Google it. I'm sure there's about a million things out there. Um, if you're going higher end on a Mac, you can use Premiere as well. I'm a Final Cut Pro editor. I love Final Cut Pro. It's a very, very different experience from Premiere. So if you're coming from one, it can be hard to switch to the other. But if you're new and you want to start in the higher end, then just get Final Cut. It's 300 bucks and it is a remarkable piece of software. Uh, and it just that's worth pointing out too. So Final Cut, it's a $300 one-time purchase. Final Cut 10, the current version, well, I mean, it's like 10 dot something, something, something. But Final Cut 10 came out, um, Actually, it has been. Has it been a decade? Not quite. And maybe it's like eight years ago now. Um, they have never charged for a single update. Every update has been free that's come out since then. I'm sure at some point they will charge something, but it's been free since then. If you're using um, Adobe Premiere, it's part of the Creative Cloud membership. It's 50 bucks a month forever. So and I think you can do a lower one, maybe 20 or 30, if you don't get all the other software, if you just get Premiere. But, um, but it's a monthly expense. So that's something to consider as well. If you're already using the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite, you've got Photoshop and Lightroom and Premiere, and then you know, you've already got it, right? So you don't have to pay anything extra. Um, but it's just one of those things to consider. So, and then you've got on the really high end, you have, uh, I shouldn't say really high end, but you have software from DaVinci, uh, from, uh, Blackmagic called DaVinci Resolve. DaVinci Resolve has history as being an extremely high, high level color creating cool color correction tool that has been brought down to a, a affordable kind of anybody can use it level. Like free. They do have a free version, that's right. That's, I forgot that. They do have a free version of Resolve um, and you pay for specific, maybe it's 4K feature, maybe 4K editing I think you have to pay for. Um, but yeah, it still is free, but it's, it's not intuitive. It's probably the hardest one to use. Um, I've never really wrapped my head around it. I've used it a few times and I just, I like Final Cut. Final Cut's awesome. It's really easy to use and really easy to get and it's just it's a beautiful tool. Where's Final Cut on the learning curve? I would put it, of pro level, I would say it's the easiest to learn. Of the pro level. Of the pro level. Um, compared to something like iMovie, it's, actually iMovie and Final Cut work very, very similarly. The whole editing paradigm that they use is the same. It's just that Final Cut is bigger with a lot more features. So if you think that you might want to get bigger later, if you start with iMovie today, when you go to Final Cut, it'll be 100% familiar. There's not a single thing you will have learned that you'll have to unlearn. The one I've been using, which is also free until you want some add-on packages, is HitFilm. Very strong on Hit film? special effects. Okay, uh, I'm not familiar with that one. Language. And that's on what platform? Yeah, it, and it's, it's free. It's, um, uh, it's got a lot of good special effects, and even with the packages that you might want to buy, it's not very expensive. Is that on Mac or PC? or? or? Uh, it's on PC. It's on PC. Okay, well, hey, there I you think go. I think it's available on a Mac as well. Okay, cool. I've also I've used Photoshop to do simple, just to try it, but it was, it was a little... Photoshop's video editing features are more about trimming clips, maybe put a couple together, but it's not an editor. It's not meant to build a story. I is, is the next step. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't try and re edit in Photoshop. That's, yeah, yeah. PC Magazine has a decent review of the PC, of the Windows platforms. Okay. Or, you know, they rank them all in terms of easy use cost, et cetera. Okay, cool. PCMag.com, I guess. Okay. Awesome, good to know. Like I said, just Googling this, you're gonna find tons of articles, tons of reviews, tons of recommendations. Um, I just, I don't work on a PC, so I can't tell you specifically where to go there, but on the Mac, iMovie is, is you know, definitely the, your easiest place to start um, and cheapest, if not freest. Uh, okay, so then, all right, next we're gonna get into delivery, but before we do that, I just wanna talk a little bit more about the storytelling aspect of it. As you, as you start shooting more and more, and you're shooting more and more video, and you're thinking, okay, now I'm gonna go on this vacation, 
and I'm going to, or this trip or whatever, and I'm going to make a video when I come back, an actual video, not just a montage of stills and, and video slideshows, but I'm gonna actually make a video. So you're gonna go see the Eiffel Tower, you're gonna go see the Louvre, you're gonna see all these, but you probably can't shoot video on the Louvre, I have no idea. Anyway, you're gonna go see all these things that you're gonna shoot video of, right? And that's, okay, I'm, we're going from point A to point B, put the camera away, get there, get the camera out and shoot. But think about the storytelling aspect of it. So now we're, we're getting bigger and deeper here, but. Think about that storytelling aspect. No one, if you just shoot the things that you're gonna see, you're back to a montage. It's just a series of shots of this thing A, thing B, and thing C. There's no story in there. But tell the story. Tell the trip of getting there. Tell the trip of on our way to the airport. We're at the airport. We're flying to France. We're, oh, we're here. We're checking into the hotel. Um, now we're gonna go take the metro for the first time. We're gonna go check out the, the Eiffel Tower. All of that stuff, while it's, a challenge to shoot all those things while you're doing everything else, getting the family moving along and getting your luggage and everything else. All of that stuff tells the story. And now people watch it and it's an actual movie. This is an actual story with a beginning and a middle and an end and a plot and maybe conflict and all the other stuff that happens that makes a good story. That's all really important to shoot as well. So you want to shoot everything that you're doing so that you have a story to craft. And then you've probably heard of a term called B-roll. B-roll is footage that you shoot that is going to get used to fill in the gaps. So I'm, I don't, we'll use the Eiffel Tower again as an example, right? So, right, the family's there, we're gonna start with the family, and she starts with the Eiffel Tower. Okay, now, give me 10 minutes, I'm gonna go shoot a bunch of B-roll, and now we're gonna get a bunch of little close-ups, just, just random shots of other things around there. Oh, there's a, a pigeon on the, on the ground running, running around. There's a, a, did the crowd, the line of people going in to, to wait to get in. Uh, maybe close-ups of the elevator buttons. All the other things that are there that aren't really critical to the story you're telling, but you need filler, you need B-roll, you need some of these other shots. So you just shoot a whole bunch of that, and then when you're editing, you've got all this other stuff to pull from. So you're building your story, and you're going, man, can we went from the cab to the Eiffel Tower, but there's no, like, there's no in between. We didn't just step out of the cab and suddenly we're at the top. I didn't shoot anything there. Okay, now I got the shot of the pigeon, and I've got the shot of people lined up, um, and I got a shot of pushing the elevator button. I put those things together, that tells the story. Even though my family's not in it, I'm not in it. It's just these little close-up shots of other things going on. I have stuff to fill it in. So you think about the storytelling aspect, but really think about that B-roll aspect. If you're on YouTube, there's this YouTuber named Peter McKinnon, who's like the king of B-roll. Um, his videos, he has gotten, it's become such a big part of his channel and what he produces that he does a thing where he's talking and then he goes, cue the B-roll. And it's just a string of beautiful shots for no other purpose than being beautiful shots. So if you want inspiration, for some of the best B-roll on YouTube, look up Peter McKinnon. His stuff's beautiful. It's kind of annoying, frankly. It's really, really good. <laughs> uh, so that's that. Okay, so that's the story part of it. Um, last aspect is delivery. How do you get this out to your audience? Who is your audience? If it's just your friends and family, then you're gonna just render it on your Mac and you need to show it on there. Maybe put it up on your TV or put it on your iPad and everybody can watch it there. But if you want more people to see it, then you've got things like Facebook. You can upload video to Facebook and that's a great way to share it just with your friends and family. Or if you want everybody in the world to see it, you put it up on YouTube. And when you put it on YouTube, it can be public so everybody can see it. Or you can put it on YouTube and make it private so you just send out the link to the friends and family you want to see it. Lots of different ways to do it, but it's really, really easy. It doesn't cost anything. These days, we have the ability to share our video, and it could be as big, as long, as fancy as you want, as complex as you want, and you can put it anywhere for free. Put it on YouTube, put it on Facebook. Um, there's a service called Vimeo. That is a paid service. Um, you can use that as well if you're doing, depends on the kind of work you're doing. If you want to sell video, access to the video, for example, to say you decide that you, know, you made this thing and this is, a, this is a proper film. I'm going to sell this thing. People can buy this for five bucks or 10 bucks or 50 bucks or whatever you want to sell it for. And then Vimeo will give you that whole back end to do that. So you can go that high end if you want to. But for the most part, most of us are just going to stick it on Facebook for our friends and family to see, put it on YouTube for the world to see, and that's it. That's all there is to it. The delivery part of it is super easy. It used to be a really big, complicated part of this. Uh, I used to, I'd have to burn a DVD, and then I had to get that DVD to someone, and they put it in a DVD player, and they had to figure out the stupid menu system. No, now it's just YouTube, hit play, done. Super, super straightforward. So that, I'm pretty sure that's everything I had on there. Yes, that is everything I wanted to show you. So, other questions? Where are we on time? Ooh, good. Excellent. We've got plenty of time for questions. Yeah. Yeah, can you say a few words about Panasonic cameras? Absolutely. I would happily say many words about Panasonic cameras. Um, okay, so I mentioned earlier that you can shoot video on pretty much anything, including mirrored cameras like Nikons and Canons. The way that when you're shooting video on a Nikon or Canon, well, a mirrored version, the mirror has to flip up out of the way, and then you're, you're recording video. You, you push a button that moves the mirror up, and now you're in the live view mode, and you can record video. 
A mirrorless camera, like the Panasonic Lumix cameras, doesn't have that mirror mechanism, so it's always in that ready-to-record video mode. Whether you're shooting stills or video, you don't have to change anything on the camera except to say, I'm going to shoot a still or shoot a video, and um, there's no mirror that flaps up out of the way. None of that happens. So you're able to shoot video the same way that you shoot stills. You can hold the camera up to your eye to shoot video. You can't do that with a mirrored camera because to shoot video, the mirror has to go up and it blocks the view through the viewfinder. You can only shoot looking at the back of the camera. Being able to shoot video held up to your eye does tend to make it a little bit easier to transition from, I'm, I always take pictures like this. This is how I take pictures. I don't do this. I do this. Okay, well, you can still do this shooting video. So that can make that transition a little bit easier as well. Uh, the, the Lumix camera, is the, the, to, the format is called Micro Four Thirds. It's a smaller sensor than what you'll find on the full frame Canons and Nikons, and a little bit smaller again than what you'll find on the APS-C size sensors that you find on most Canons and Nikons that most people purchase, because um, they're more affordable than the full frames. So it is a little bit of a smaller sensor still. It is ideal for video. It is perfect for video. You are getting a sensor size that will give you native 4K video if you want to do 4K um, without any cropping into the frame. So when you shoot 4K on this camera, what you see through the viewfinder is everything. If you grab uh, many of the other cameras out there and you shoot, so let's say you're looking through the viewfinder and this is what you see, and then you start shooting 4K video and it crops in a little bit because it's not using the whole sensor. And then you shoot HD video, standard, H, standard high definition, and it crops in even more and you're just using just that part of the sensor. These cameras use the entire sensor, so you have, uh, you have more data coming in to create the image with, so you, at the end of the day, end up getting a higher quality image. Really, really good stuff. Uh, just like in any other um, uh, camera lineup, there's a ton of lenses to choose from, from your you know, super wides to long telephotos. They're, because they're the mirrorless and the Micro Four Thirds specifically, they're smaller and lighter weight. For those of you that were in my travel photography course yesterday, I talked about the advantages of size and weight and how much smaller and lighter they are. Um, this camera here, this is the G9, which is primarily a still camera, but shoots phenomenal video as well. This is the biggest camera you can buy from Lumix, this tiny little thing here. The small ones are about half this size. It's remarkable. And that's the same sensor size, same lens you mount. Digital, digital viewfinder still? Yeah, well, you're always going to have a digital viewfinder because it's mirrorless. Right, think about, think about what it is. Um, a mirrored camera... When you look through the viewfinder, you are seeing the light that is coming through the lens. Right? It comes in from the lens, it hits a mirror, bounces up into the pentaprism. That's this block right here. Right? That light bounces up into the pentaprism, hits another mirror, and bounces out through the viewfinder. So you're seeing the light coming through here. When you're shooting mirrorless, there is no mirror here. That just doesn't exist. So the image, the light coming in through the lens, hits the sensor directly which means that for you to be looking through a viewfinder, you're looking at what's essentially a TV screen showing you what the sensor sees. There are advantages and disadvantages. Fortunately, the disadvantages are almost completely non-existent now. If you picked up a mirrorless camera a decade ago and you looked through the viewfinder, it was very slow and stuttery. If you saw any kind of action, you'd be following the action and then you pull your head up and you realize the action's over there and the viewfinder's still catching up. It was a horrible experience. Those days are gone. You now have 120 or I think even up to 240 frame per second refresh inside of the viewfinder. The viewfinders are extremely bright and because it's digital, it can be enhanced. So it's kind of like your cyborg world, right? You're like human, but better. You've got the real world enhanced. You have, if you're in a really dark environment and you're looking through the glass, well, you see a really dark environment. Where you're looking at a electronic viewfinder, it can boost it up so you can actually see what's in front of you. So you look at the viewfinder, you see things that you can't see with the naked eye because it's, it's enhanced. Um, when you're shooting with electronic viewfinder, any change that you make to the camera, you're going to see through the viewfinder in real time. If you under or overexpose the shot, you're going to see through the viewfinder it getting brighter or darker. If you decide to shoot in vivid mode, so you have all really bright saturated colors, or shoot in black and white mode, you will see through the viewfinder in black and white or in those vivid colors. You get all of that through the viewfinder on a mirrorless camera. And this isn't unique to Panasonic Lumix cameras. You'll see the same thing on, on your Olympus, on your Sony. Any mirrorless camera, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing what the sensor sees, which also means that you see the exact same thing through the viewfinder or on the LCD panel on the back of the camera. So you get the same view either place. It just becomes a matter of convenience. What do you prefer to use? Another really neat advantage of that is, you know how, so you take a picture and you can play it back right on the back of your camera, right? With electronic viewfinder, you can play it back through the viewfinder. So you can actually see it through here. So there's a lot of different uses for this. The most obvious one is a super, super bright daylight day where you just can't really see the viewfinder that clearly. You put your eye up here and you can see it perfectly. So you can 
with your eye up to the camera, hit play and cycle through your pictures, zoom into it to make sure it was sharp, do all the things you would normally do, but you can do it while you're like this, so you get a perfect view of it. That's pretty cool. Um, if you're shooting for a client, you're working with someone, you can shoot, and you know how you can have the picture show automatically after you take the picture? You can do that or just hit the play button up to you. But I can be shooting a portrait of someone and then I can just hit a button and see the shot and without, ever, without having to do this in front of the client, which kind of breaks the flow of what you're doing, the portrait you're shooting. Um, I can look at it through the viewfinder and they just think you're still taking pictures. You're like, you smile, smile, you have no idea. They could be picking their nose, you have no idea. You're looking through pictures, okay, let's keep going. Um, and it's a really neat thing to be able to do. I do that a lot just to keep that, kind of breaking, keep from breaking that concentration. It's another way to work. But yeah, so that's one of the advantages of that too. Um, what else do you guys want to know? Uh, there's so, I mean, I could talk about the cameras themselves like all day long. So are there any specific things that you'd like to know about, about the mirrorless cameras? Yeah. So um, I, I bought two Panasonic's in the past year, cool. and, I'm, and I'm wondering what your recommendation would be for like YouTube or, or documentaries. I mean, I got the camcorder, I got the HC uh, VX870, and then I got the Panasonic Lumix uh, FC, I can't I'm talking about the numbers, 300 or what? Okay. Okay, so the first two you're talking about are, are video cameras. Um, and now you're talking about the Lumix camera, which is a still, it's a hybrid camera. We call these hybrid cameras. They shoot stills and video equally well. Some of them are a little bit more geared towards video production. Some of them are a little bit more geared towards still production. Uh, but they all have the ability to shoot both stills and video. As far as what you would use for making YouTube videos, I mean, they're all going to shoot, all the Lumix cameras shoot 4K video. So you can shoot full 4K if you want to. Um, they all are going to shoot at 30 frames per second or 25 if you're in Europe. And then the higher end ones will do true 24 if you want to have that native film look. But even a lot of the, most of the um, regular ones will shoot what's kind of a, a it's 23.98, which basically looks like 24, but it's compatible with your normal TV. We don't need to get into all that. But, um, but all of the cameras will shoot video. So then it just becomes what features do you want? The main differences between going from a smaller little Lumix camera up to the bigger like the GH5, a huge part of it is the amount of buttons, physical buttons that you have. If I'm shooting a professional video, I don't want to have to go digging through a menu to change something. I want as much access to things as quickly as possible as I can. And most of the buttons on these cameras are programmable. You can set it to do whatever you want. Like I never use that mode, I never use that button as it's programmed, so I'll reprogram it to make it do what I want it to do. Super, super valuable. So you have just more flexibility on the bigger cameras. Um, bigger, the bigger, more pro-end cameras are going to have additional high-end video features, but if you're just kind of vlogging type stuff, you probably don't need those. Any of the video, any of the Lumix cameras are going to do for you. No, Micro Four Thirds is the size of the sensor. So, okay, let me, let me address that real quick and I'll come back to you because I saw that look like, uh, so I, I know that look. <laughs> yeah, no, um, so there are advantages to full frame and there are advantages to a smaller sensor. The advantages of full frame primarily are you have a shallower depth of field at any given focal length distance to subject. That's just physics, there's no avoiding that. What I hear a lot as a, as a uh, uh, Micro Four Thirds advocate is, oh, you can't get shallow depth of field with Micro Four Thirds. You can't get bokeh with Micro Four Thirds. Nothing could be farther from the truth. You have to have a faster lens to get that same level of bokeh that you would on a full frame, but it doesn't mean you can't do it. It doesn't mean the lenses aren't there. The advantage of, well, one of the many advantages of shooting Micro Four Thirds, there's your size, there's your weight, but then there's the cost. It costs less to buy these cameras. The most expensive camera you can buy from Panasonic is $2,200? I think that's right, for the GH5S, which is a very specialized video-centric camera. The GH5 is under $2,000. The G9, which is the one that's really marketed for uh, the kind of high-end stills camera, I think is sixteen or $1,700. That's the most expensive, right? What's your top-end Nikon or Canon? $6,000, $8,000? Very, very different. So all the money that you save on that, you can now go out and buy really, really nice lenses. So you can buy those re that really fast glass. You know, get rid of the kit lens that it came with and buy some really good glass and get that really good shallow depth of field back. Yeah, my Panasonic uh, camera FC300 is limited to 30 minutes of video. Okay. Thanks to the European Union. Right. Even though they sell a different model there. How can I work around it? Buy a different camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what he's talking about is every, every, every is not the right word. Many of the cameras that you buy 
um, Canon, Nikon, Sony, all, all these other manufacturers are limited to recording video for 29 minutes and 29 seconds. This is a weird European tax law that says anything that shoots under 30 minutes is not a video camera. If it is classified as a video camera, it's a different tax level on it and you pay more for the camera. So manufacturers don't want to have to charge you more, so they limit it to that. And unless you're shooting things like this that I'm shooting right here today, or a school play or something, you don't need more than 30 minutes. Because if you're shooting shots that are that long, dude, you gotta work on your shooting. Because you want short pieces, right? Think about the films that you watch, it's cuts, it's cuts. There's no more than a few seconds on screen at once. So if you're shooting more than a couple of minutes even, you're probably shooting too much. Again, unless you're doing something like this, you're recording an event, then obviously you need that longer recording time. Um, the Lumix cameras, the higher end ones, so the G9, the GH5, those do not have that limit. Panasonic has, you know, you're paying it obviously, but the tax is in there. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. You're gonna get a full unlimited recording. And these cameras, in fact, have dual card slots. So you two SD card slots in there. If you plug this into, a, um, into the wall, I plug it into power, you can record infinitely. Because as one card fills up, it goes over to the second card, you pop out the first card, pop in a replacement, and then it goes from two back to one, back and forth, back and forth. You can record forever and ever and ever. Uh, so that's pretty cool if you really you don't need to record that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so that, there's no way around that limit on a camera like the FC300. On some cameras you get, um, on some third-party cameras, some, sorry, some other brand cameras, you might get a clean HDMI out. That's where the video signal comes out, the HDMI port, and it's clean, doesn't have any menu information on it. And then you can plug into an external recorder. Our friends from Atomos are here. They sell external recorders that are really, really awesome. Um, but most high-end cameras are going to not have that limit anyway, so it's not a, not a concern. Yeah. I was going to say, are camcorders usually the option to, if you're going to shoot, like, two-hour event? Well, yeah, a camcorder is classified as a video camera, so yes, it's going to record infinitely. I mean, well, until you run out of tape or, or disc or the battery, yeah. What, what about the G9? Is there a way around the 30-minute uh, limit? The G9, the G9 has a 10-minute limit on 4K60, um, and that is a heat issue, right? So the reason that these cameras are... <laughs> so big <laughs> compared to the smaller ones uh, is this is one massive heat sink. It's a big hunk of chunk of metal on there to absorb and distribute the heat that is generated by shooting 4K 60p video. The G9 being that it's not designed for video specifically, um, it doesn't have as much heat dissipation in it. So you can shoot 4K 60 but only up to 10 minutes and the camera goes time to stop. Just cool down for a little bit um, and that's just built into it. I, I don't, is there a 30 minute limit for 4K 30? I don't I heard that there was. I'd have to look. I'd have to look. So if the G9 has a limit, a 30 minute limit for video, um, that would be the tax thing. I don't think it does. But if it does, this camera does have a clean HDMI out. So you can plug it into an external recorder and record all day long that way. So that's how you would work around it. Yes. So generally, how long do you have to stop if it's a heat issue? Um, not long at all. It's usually just a few seconds. Long enough for it to write to the card and then it'll pick back up again. It's, I don't understand the thermo thermodynamics of all this. I'm just telling you what I was told. But um, I know it seems weird. It seems like it would just keep going. But, um, but yeah, that's, yeah. You recommend McKinnon. How about for general video uh, source of information? For technique or for inspiration? More te uh, all of the above. <laughs> yes. uh, um, I mean, technique, watch my channel. Photo Joseph, yeah, I mean, I'm talking about video and still production all the time. What's, what's the channel? Photo Joseph, youtube.com slash photo Joseph. Okay. Here, I should put my, put my main slide up again. There we go, Sorry. that's me, that's right. Um, yeah, because that, that's what I do. If you want to watch beautiful video, Peter McKinnon's a king. Um, if you want to watch really, really good storytelling, Casey Neistat. He's a vlogger and he just, he can craft a story like no one else. Uh, Casey, C-A-S-E-Y. Nystat, N-E-I-S-T-A-T. -E he's got over 10 million subs on YouTube. My God. <laughs> yeah, he's, a, he's just a phenomenal storyteller. Oh. Oh. F-log, I read about it, I have no idea what they're talking about. V-log, V-log, okay. Yeah, sure, um, so that's V-log, you're getting into really high-end video production. Yeah, so what vlog is, so when, you know how you, you have your camera profiles, you can choose your vivid or standard or portrait or black and white or whatever. Um, 
Vlog is a profile that is a very flat profile. When you look at the footage, your shadows are muddy, your highlights are muddy, it's very flat. It's designed to be graded. You have to take that into the computer and do color correction on it. The reason that you shoot that way is you end up with more dynamic range. Because of the way things are compressed while they're captured, you, the, the ranges are compressed, you get more shadow detail, more highlight detail than you would shooting non-Vlog. But you have to grade it. You can't. It's, that's, it's similar, it's not raw but it is closer to raw, it's kind of somewhere in between. Uh, like, yeah, just like a raw photo, you have extra data in there, but the difference is that in a raw photo, you have a larger bit depth of data. So you could have, your final output is gonna be 8-bit, that's what's gonna go on screen and go on to you know, Flickr, or Facebook, or wherever you're putting your pictures. Um, but the camera sensor captures more, it captures 10 bits or 12 bits or 14 bits of data. That data is all in the raw file and you can then compress that in in post. Vlog video, and if you're shooting, Vlog is, is for Panasonic, that's Vericam log, Sony's is S log, Canon's is C log. Oh, yeah, that's, why, that's probably why. So maybe Fuji is F log? I don't, that would make sense. Maybe that's, okay, there you go. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, what they've done there is the video file is not raw. So the video file is still an 8-bit or a 10-bit video file, depending on what camera you're shooting with. Um, but the sensor is able to take more data than that and kind of push it into a compressed space. And it doesn't just push it to the edges of the eight or 10 bit limit, it pushes it even farther. So you have a little bit of extra headroom and you have the ability to stretch that out. So instead of taking more data and pushing it in, like you would with raw video, uh, raw stills, you're taking more data that's been pushed and stretching it back out again. So it's a bit of a weird thing to work with, but uh, so it does take the extra effort, but, um, but it can look great. If you want that, like the best, best out of your camera, that's how you would shoot it. You just gotta work for it later. So is that like an update to your firmware to get that option? Okay, so the GH5, the, the only Lumix cameras that have Vlog are the GH series cameras. Your GH4 before it, the GH5 and the GH5S. Um, the GH5, it is an add-on. It's a $100 firmware update to get that. The GH5S comes with it built in. It comes with it natively. And it's extra work. Why is it extra work? Because you have to color grade it. You can't, oh, well, if I play it, okay. all right, if I play log footage, it just looks muddy and flat. You can't, you have to color grade it, right? And it can be as easy as adding something called a LUT. A LUT is kind of like a preset. You could just drop on there and it looks probably pretty good, but that's, you don't shoot log to just throw a LUT on there. It'd be the equivalent of shooting raw plus JPEG just to throw the raw away. That's not why you shoot it that way. It's great for previews. It's great for a quick job. Um, when you're looking at the back of the camera, you would actually load a LUT into the camera so that you see a, f a shot that looks normal as opposed to this really flat. Because it's really hard to shoot when what you're looking at is so flat on the viewfinder. Uh, you want to see it kind of normal. Otherwise, you don't really know where your shadows are. You, gotta read, you have to read histograms and, and um, waveforms, and it's, just, it's more complicated. So, yeah, you want to do that. I'm getting the time sign in the back. Um, I am going to start breaking things down here. If you've got more questions, Feel free to talk to me while I'm breaking down, or actually let's, we'll get out there and you can take as much time as you like. But thank you very much, guys. I hope you feel like you learned something today. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.